Okay. Great. I'm sorry about that. We oh, live... no, no worries. It's just part of how it goes. <laughs> it is. This whole internet thing is awesome, but it also comes with perils. <laughs> it's so true. I mean, it could have been happening on my end. It's just one of those things that you just never know, you know? Yep. Thank you for your patience with all this uh, rescheduling business. Of course. Yeah. I know. Um, is this your first day off in a long time? Yeah. I'm not actually even off, but I'm Yeah. I would say this is your one day off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is your, this is you not working right now. That's right. So we're going to, we're going to get through yeah. it. It's going to be okay. Yeah. So it's I thought, be good. Um, we'll refresh you. <laughs> that's right. I thought maybe, um, let's do the whole time for my main podcast today. And then that'll introduce you to my folks. And then I'll have you guest host a spiritual brain surgery episode later. I think that would be awesome. Sounds great. Yeah, I was actually already thinking about like what the, the takeover that you were talking about. So I would, I'd be honored to do that. And that would be probably make it easier on your life to just have it rather than have to schedule you again. <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah. So um, yeah. we're going to do my show and then your show. And we'll switch to Zoom for yours, right? Perfect. Yep. Okay. Exactly. All right. Perfectly. And you're doing okay out there in Nashville today? Yeah. Everything's good. Feeling okay. good. All right. Let's get after it then. So All right. I am recording. Okay. Perfect. Friend, we're back and I'm so excited to be introducing a new friend. You're going to get to know her really well. We've got Lee Ann Ellington from Nashville here with us. Hi, Lee Ann. Hello, so good to be here. I'm so grateful that you took the time and that you were so patient with me. This is the third time we've tried to get this done today with my neurosurgery practice has, has been driving me nuts lately. Hey, you're saving lives. What can we do? You that's know? right. That's right. <laughs> hey, I want to shout out our mutual friend, Maddie Jackson Smith, for hooking us up with each other. Thanks, Maddie, for that. And we all love her so much and I'm grateful that, that she connected us. Um, Give us a give us a thirty thousand foot view of your deal, your story. You've got a fascinating, multifaceted life, and I'm, we're going to tell people all about it. But give us the high level view here today, Leanne. Yeah, high level view is you know I grew up as an overweight, out of shape, sedentary child, and brought those habits with me into adulthood. Um, and so my self image and my body image reflected that throughout my life until my early 20s. I hit my first enough is enough point and through a lot of the wrong ways and maybe some of the right ways, I went on and lost close to a hundred pounds thinking. So oh, wait, Riverside, I lost is, audio Riverside is telling me that you're not recording on your end. It says Leanne Ellington's browser prevented recording. It says okay, cool. the host should stop this. recording. Oh wait, for it's all. having me scan a QR code real quickly. I've never Hold seen on. that before. <laughs> We're getting all kinds of changes. And now it just went away. Is it recording now? I'm gonna start it over. It says you need to refresh your browser. Oh, okay. Let's Let do me that. refresh it. So if I disconnect, I'll come back. Yep. Hold on. Refreshing now. Okay. There we go. Okay. Is that better? I hope so. I don't know what's going on today. Okay. This is one of those yep. things, whenever um, we have a hard time, it always means that there's something really important that's happening. We got to gotta press through it. Okay. Okay. And hey, worst comes to worst, if we need to record on my end, I can send you the files and everything um, yeah. right away. If it if it ends up worse than worse, we have a backup. And that's how it works with Riverside too. So we have, if it, if it, fails internet wise we at least have our local recording so it'll be okay we're gonna be fine so okay. <laughs> let's get started right, cool. so do you want to totally start over yeah let's start okay over. all right all right this is fun so okay here we go <laughs> Friend, we're back, and I'm so excited to be here to introduce you to a new friend that you're going to get to know very well. She has an incredible story, and we are here with Leanne Ellington from Nashville, Tennessee. Welcome to the show, Leanne. Hello. So glad to be here. <laughs> we have had multiple challenges getting together, mostly with my schedule and today with the internet. So thank you for your perseverance and your grace. Of course, always. It's, it's um, showing me that my browser is preventing recording again. It's uh, up on my are you end kidding me? 
Okay, hold on. It's going to have me scan a QR code. Let me just see. I'm going to scan the QR code. Okay, now it's taking me to Riverside FM. That's and really that weird. Didn't... I've done 500 interviews with Riverside. I've never seen that pop up before. It says optimize quality da, 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 and start record. If your camera has auto light exposure, I mean, I'm on a laptop. Optimize quality. Mm. And I think it's wanting that QR code is just the um, the app of Riverside. But let me double check. Riverside. Yeah, it's wanting me to download the app. Wow. Um, Never seen that. Do you want me to try? I mean, it's a light exposure. Let me try opening my window and see if it gives you more brightness. Hold on. This shouldn't keep you from recording, though. I'm also using an external mic just for better quality. So yeah. do you want me to try unplugging the external no, mic? That shouldn't affect the recording. I mean, it always wants us to use external mic, so. Yeah. Um, Are you recording with a PC or a Mac or something? or? It's a Mac. I'm on yeah, a Mac. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Really weird. Sorry, my camera's over there, so I'm looking at the computers Did, over here. So. Oh, no, you're fine. Did it I'm change anything? Does anything. It, is it giving you an update right now? Because I just act out of that little notification. It's not saying anything else on my end. Does it show that it's recording? It was. I stopped it to restart. It didn't tell me that time that it was a problem. So maybe it was the old one. But let's just try it again. One more time. Third time's a charm. Okay, cool. All right. If it pops up, we'll know. Here we go. Three, two, one. All right, you got a good window on your side, no pop-ups or anything? Nope, I'm good on my all side. Right. This feels like recording a, or <laughs> re-filming a movie or something with all the takes from the yeah. director. or Groundhog's Day <laughs> with Bill Murray. <laughs> yeah. We're going to get it right this time, though. Okay, maybe we need to pray about it. Let's pray. Yes, let's do that. God, it's Good Friday. Uh, it's the day that you put it all on the line for us, and we're so grateful that we don't just have a, a God that we follow who died for us, but we have a God who overcame death, hell, and the grave, and rose. And we, we serve a risen Savior and not an empty tomb, and, and not a filled tomb, but an empty tomb. And, and we're so grateful for you. And, and we feel like there's a, a threat or a challenge to this, this conversation, and that means it's going to help some people. So we ask you to overcome any sort of technological issues or, or anything that might be hindering us from getting this conversation recorded so that we can reach out and give hope to people around the world. Thank you for Leanne and her time and her patience and grace with this process. And we just pray that you put your hand on us right now and let this happen in a way that's going to honor you and serve you to folks around the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right, let's get after it. So, okay, any pop ups on your side? Nope, so far so good. good. Is it say it's recording me? It okay. does. Yeah. All right. So it's recording. I've got it, and I have a backup audio. So even if the video doesn't look right this time, we'll just press on. We'll do the audio if we have to. So that's fine. Perfect. Okay. Friend, we're back, and I'm so excited. This is actually, you don't know this, but this is the fourth time we've tried to record this intro. We're having all kinds of internet problems and fun things today, and that means that the conversation you're about to hear is really important, and I'm excited to introduce a new friend who's going to become a well-known person to you in the coming weeks and months. I've got Leanne Ellington from Nashville, Tennessee. Welcome to the show, Leanne. Hello. So glad to be here. And I am grateful for you and your patience, and today's been a little challenge, but the last two weeks we've tried to record this, and I've had neurosurgery jump up and get in the way, so thank you so much for pushing through all that. Absolutely. I cannot complain about neurosurgery, so <laughs> you're, you're excused. That's awesome. <laughs> it's a good, good use. I want to shout out our mutual friend, Maddie Jackson-Smith, for introducing us and hooking us up. I've been, uh, love Maddie, and she's so great. And our, our listeners today are familiar with her and just so kind of her to hook us up. So thank you so much, Maddie, for that. Shout out to you. And Leanne, give yes. us a, I've told the folks a little bit about you already, but give us a 30,000-foot view of your life and your story, and then we're going to go deep in it. Sure. Yeah. 30,000 foot view, just to kind of give some context. Um, you know, my childhood, I was a sedentary, overweight, out of shape couch potato and um, didn't know anything different um, and didn't have God in my life at the time. And um, through when when I hit my early 20s, I hit my first enough is enough point And through a lot of wrong ways and maybe some of the right ways, I went on to lose close to 100 pounds. Wow. Um, thinking that that would make me feel 
happy and beautiful and all the things that I thought I, that it would fill the gap of. Um, unbeknownst to me, though, I gave myself disordered eating and a very toxic self-image and body image to get myself there, but didn't know that was even a thing. Wow. Um, and so, you know, through a series of core life crises, but also um, really opening myself up to basically becoming my own advocate and, and studying things like biomechanics and psychology and behavior science. And then a, a spine surgery, ironically, is what led me to start studying neuroscience, not even knowing <laughs> what that was at the time. Um, but that's what I needed to heal myself from, from complications after a spine surgery. But through a culmination of all those things, I realized that the problems that I was trying to solve with diet and weight loss and food and my weight um, was really in my brain, through my thoughts and my beliefs and my behavior. And it wasn't until I started taking that approach, because th th the other side of it too is after I lost all this weight, I was left with a self-image, what I would call a residue, yeah. where I was still seeing myself through these goggles where I thought, I, you know, I call them my fat goggles because that's what my brain was telling me and calling myself. And I believe that we all have our own goggles, but you know, unworthy, unlovable, um, broken, you know, yeah. lost cause, all these things. And of course, weight loss to heal that. So long story, a little less long. Um, in the midst of that, I, I found God and had and started my faith journey, which is its own journey on itself. But really neuroscience is what led me to, to feel like it resonated with me and landed with me. Um, but fast forwarding to present day, um, you know, now I help women that, you know, the millions of women that struggle with disordered eating and self image and body image, I help them re heal that wow. by taking a brain first approach to healing their struggles by really reconciling the identity that's causing them to think and act and feel and behave the way that they are so that they can be set up for success um, on their health journey. And I define health as this three-dimensional mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, social kind of you know journey, right. but really help them set themselves up for life so they're no longer dabbling with band-aids and short-term gratification traps. So that's kind of the cliff notes of everything. That's amazing. Now, you, you, you kind of went past it pretty quickly, but when you talk about how you found God, I mean, your, your story of finding God is really intricate and interesting. So unpack that a little bit for us, because you came out of sort of secular Judaism, right? And just help us understand yeah. that, how you found him and how science was kind of part sure. of that. And that's a fascinating story. Absolutely. Well, I am a bacon-loving, Hebrew-speaking Jew um, <laughs> who found Jesus um, about five years ago. And how that happened was, you know, the way I d kind of describe it in, in secular Judaism, you know, it was a heritage. It was a culture. It was, you know, the history. I mean, my, my grandparents were in the Holocaust. So it's very, it was very important. Judaism was very important to me, but it was never God. It was never faith. It was more like a culture. Um, and so right. I... And, and, and in a way, I, I think I was raised to believe that Jesus was in the category of like Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. It was just kind of this thing that I just thought was not something to even explore. So um, honestly, it wasn't until I had um, my probably third or fourth like core life crises, right, where I ended up down on my knees in surrender in a pile of tears with this awareness that I can only describe now as a gift from God of like, I can't do this on my own anymore and I don't want to do it on my own anymore. Wow. So I started seeking out the word surrender. That's the word that kept coming up to me, surrender, surrender. And I never explored that word. So I literally asked my friend, Hey, what are some good church? What has good music? I'm in Nashville. Who's got good worship music? And they told me about this place called cross point. And my first question was like, are Jews just allowed to walk into a church? Because I didn't know, you know, and they're like, yeah, everyone's welcome is their tagline. So I went and I was like, okay, Jews are welcome. Um, I went there and I immediately felt goosebumps from the music and the message. The concept of Jesus was very far away from me at first. It felt a little bit weird at the time, to be honest, but I just met myself where I was and I substituted the word God or universe at the time. Um, but in the meantime, I was, you know, deep in the throes of neuroscience and understanding why I do what I do and um, why I create the beliefs that I have and talking about self-image identity for a decade at this point, you know, without understanding um, what identity is truly rooted in, right? And so the other side of it was I had an awareness, which again, only a gift from God, 
of this idea of self-image and self-love and self-acceptance. It was so like hyper dependent on me. Right. And so that was another awareness of like, this is all being done through me. And so for about a year, I just, what I call dipped my toes into Christianity um, and started going to church and joining small groups and getting the word. And about a year into it, um, I had my moment where I, I, I believed it just like hit wow. me like a ton of bricks. And that's another story for another day. Um, but it for like at that time I was like, okay, like God, I'm going to give you everything. My, um, uh, my physical life, my love life. Um, cause at the time I was, you know, still kind of recovering from the mindset of like, God, am I going to be alone the rest of my life? Yeah. Fast forward. I just got married a few months ago, but, Congratulations. Um, you know, I gave my, thank you. Um, I gave my finances to, to God. I gave my coping mechanisms to God because, um, I mean, I had used every, everything as a coping mechanism. Um, you know, anxiety that I was trying to like meditate and journal and you know, psychoanalyze my way through every single morning. All of a sudden, I didn't have to work so hard to have. There was that peace beyond understanding that I had heard about, but never even knew. So all of this kind of intersected. And that's what woke me up to this idea of like, wait a minute, I'm teaching self-imaging and I'm teaching about brain, but it also intersects with this idea of, you know, for me, in a way, it was just, first of all, like trying on this idea of unconditional love, like the eyes, yeah. like borrowing the goggles, you know, of unconditional love, unconditional acceptance that even when I don't think I deserve it kind of acceptance. Um, and I just started kind of interspersing that in my stressless eating curriculum and it just started opening doors. And then women that were just like me, that maybe they had been, they had fallen away from God or they felt disconnected from God because they had so much shame. And they're like, I know I'm not supposed to have all the shame, but I still carry it. So then they had shame about their shame, or maybe they grew up in a, in a, a religious, like a, a law driven, you know, um, punishment driven or whatever kind of, um, view of God. And they felt they, d- they disconnected from it, or they didn't agree with how their parents up brought them, whatever the case was. Right. But then all of a sudden my stressless eating curriculum, where I was helping women heal from the food and body prison was now not just self imaging and identity work around that. It became the gateway to God. Um, and so there's a lot I could say that happened in between and around that, but Again, that's just the kind of 30,000 foot view of that. And now, I mean, God is the central focus of my life and and my priority. You know, the first thing that I turn to when things are good and when they're good. <laughs> wow. It's kind of appropriate. We're recording this on Good Friday, the holy weekend for Christians. And your story really... It started with, hey, you need to die to some of the ideologies and ideas that you've been carrying, some of the work that you've felt like you had to do, and you need to let somebody else help you. That's kind of a that's kind of a good metaphor for today, isn't it? A thousand percent. You know, it, at first it was my weight. Like I was like, oh, when I, when I lose the weight, then I'll feel lovable, worthy. But then I started hiding behind like, oh, I'll show the people, how, show the world how smart I can be or how successful I can be or how accomplished I can be. And my, my worthiness was found in everything outside of me, bank balance, scale size, relationship status, you name it. And yeah, I mean, I had to die to myself a thousand times. I still die to myself every day in ways, you know, because yeah. I catch myself going, chasing those worldly pursuits as well as, as we all do. But yeah, I mean, that was, that was probably one of the big things of like the idea of dying to myself and give my life over to Jesus. Like that was, that was the big hurdle, like kind of, I was trying to academic my way through that or trying to logic and reason my way through that. And you can't logic and reason a spiritual pursuit like that. Right. You know what I mean? Like for a, for a while I was too smart for, for God, you know? And now I'm like, oh my gosh, like I've been, God's been in me the whole time, you know? That's right. I think that's a that's a good kind of example of this whole left brain right brain conundrum that we all are in. We spend so much time trying to sort of hyper focus and pursue and and turn something into a thing that we can grab and understand and hold on to tightly. That's all this left brain stuff and and to to really find peace and joy and and meaning, you've got to learn how to turn all that off and let your whole experience, the whole right side of your brain come in and be part of the conversation too. And that's where God is, is, is in that place where we can listen and hear and the still small voice happens. And, and that surrender process you described is exactly right. So it's, it's amazing to me how God drew you from a secular Jewish background to a kid who was interested in science. And, and you found him through the things that he created, which is what Paul told us was going to happen in Romans 1, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, it, I, I think God is smiling at all the dots that I'm now connecting where I now see he was, oh, he was in that or he was yeah. talking to me through that where I wouldn't have called it God at the time. Right. Um, and I didn't know that he was talking to me, but now I look back and I see it all. And it really was, that's that whole dying to process and allowing my logic and reason brain to just, just let her be there. Like I wasn't dismissing her, like letting her be there and, and have her skepticism and fear and, and, you know, logic and reason, but like quiet her long enough to just say, Hey, that, that quiet place where this is not something to figure out right? This is a receiving, this is allowing, this is the surrender. And I think for, you know, when you're, when you're wearing strong, a strong suit, like you're, you know, like I'm going to, you know, I'm smart or I'm accomplished or whatever. And it's just like, you're, you're hustling for your worthiness. It's almost like those two places can exist and like the dying to and the surrender that that's where the the magic happens. You know, that's right. That's the beauty of it. That's right. I, I I figured out a long time ago. My, my second book, the subtitle was "Faith, Doubt, and the Things We Think We Know." And, and what I figured out was that that if you tie your happiness or your joy or your purpose or any part of your life to things that can be taken from you or things that that you might be wrong about that you thought you knew this and it's not actually true, then you're really in trouble. I mean, you're, you're walking on a bridge that might collapse. And and so what has to happen at some point is you have to tie yourself to something that can't be taken from you. And I think that's when we realized how important God and faith is. So when did you hit that that place where you said, okay, I'm ready to to step out from knowledge and control to something that's a little bit squishier than that in faith? And what was it? Just unpack that a little bit more deeply for me, that movement from yeah. from control to faith. Yeah. It's, you know, the first time I can actually like visually picture is I was on a paddleboard in the middle of a lake uh, before I made the move to Tennessee. And I ended up, this was not planned and I'd never done this before, but I literally fell to my knees crying. Um. Uh, I was listening to Sarah, Sarah Barella's Hercules. And (laughs) it was that moment when I, what I just described, like, I can't do this anymore. Right. And, and part of it is uh, before I got into the work that I do now, where I really help women heal the root of their food and body struggles. um, I actually had gotten into the fitness industry originally because I, I was like, oh, fitness changed my life. Weight loss changed my life. Because again, I, I hadn't seen what I hadn't seen yet. I had no idea that my identity was so rooted in how I looked yeah. or how many times I was on TV or whatever, right? And so that um, summer on my knees in, on the paddleboard um, was when I, that's the first time that I felt, and again, I didn't call it God at the time, but that's when I first started like listening to what probably the time I called the universe, right? Um, where, you know, from the outside looking in, I was, I was at the peak of my career. I had, you know, this very successful fitness business. I had, um, a staff working for me. I had hundreds of clients. Um, it was very like scaled and I didn't have to do a lot of like work inside the business. I was on TV every single week. I was there, you know, they, the, the media of the whole fat girl to fit girl angle. And they kind of, you know, put me all over TV. And so I was at the outside world. And so what do you think happened to my self worth? It was measured by my weight how many clients I had, how you know successful I was, how many times I was on TV, all these things. And so that moment on the paddleboard, I heard I heard God say, just just walk away. Just wow. shut it down. And I was like, whoa, like I'm supposed to just shut this down. And that was the first time I remember like having a conversation with the universe, <laughs> right? Which I yeah. now know was God. And I remember people saying to me, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to figure it out. And they're like, how are you going to make money? I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to figure it out. Like, I know I can't keep going down this dead end road anymore. It was this unspoken knowingness. And that summer is when I discovered, because if I'm, if I'm not a fitness, you know, expert anymore, who am I? If I'm not, if I'm not bringing in all this income, who am I? If I'm not on TV anymore, who am I? Um, And that's when I realized that everything that I had chasing was empty and meaningless. Wow. And that was when I started, um, I, I had read the book psycho cybernetics, yeah. uh, by, by Maxwell Maltz many yeah. years before that. And I remember this idea of him. He was a, a famous plastic surgeon who did a lot of operation on people and realized that their appearance changes didn't reflect their self image. And so he started, um, his science of the self image. And I remember thinking that I'm like, okay, the weight loss feels emptiness and empty and meaningless. The money is empty and meaningless. The recognition on TV, empty and meaningless. And that's when I first started just breaking it down. And that's when I 
I basically, I lied to myself in so many ways that summer and started building myself back up. And that's when I also hit the head where I was like, okay, this food body struggle that you're hiding behind, because I was still like out exercising my eating habits and trying to out diet poor mindset. You know, that's when I really was like, okay, it's time to take all of this, this stuff that you've been learning and really heal. And in order to do that, you probably need to stop trying to be a leader for other people in that way and lead wow. yourself. Um, but that's when also the surrender conversation happened. So that's really what paved the way. And then a couple years later, I moved to Nashville and I mean, there's churches on every corner and worship music. And so a couple of years later is when I first walked into a church. So that's, it took a couple of years for me to really get the memo. I think that like maybe the universe was God, but I, I think I needed to go through almost like destruction of like, I needed to destroy what was an excellent because it was just holding me down, bugging me down and keeping me attached and chasing after idols that would never fill the voids I was seeking to fill. Never. Wow. You know, so there's um, so yeah. much, there's so much depth. To, uh, this is like five or six episodes. We could talk about what you just, what you just unpacked in, in three minutes. But I think th that's part of why I think the metaphor, when God says he's a consuming fire, I think that's what he's talking about. He, you got to let him burn stuff out of you. That's not the essential stuff that he wants to build you up from. And I think that th the next layer of that, maybe you talked about all this, this sort of superficial or external stuff, you know, my, my performance, my, my income, my identity, my my ability to get on television, my fame or whatever. But the next layer of it, probably that people are listening out there, a lot of our listeners today, Leanne, are going to be folks who have lost a child or they've, they've become widowed yes. like Maddie or, or something like that. Some kind of big, massive, you know, relational thing has happened. And, and it's just as true. Like if, if I'm not a parent anymore, who am I? If I'm not a spouse anymore, who am I? If, if I don't have this or that or that other thing that I thought my life was about. What am I? And so maybe speak to somebody right now from your perspective who is just going through the thing. They, they lost the job. They, they're not going to be that thing anymore, or they just got the diagnosis, or they just got home from the funeral. Like somebody's right in the thick of it. What do you say to them from your perspective about what happens now that would be helpful to them or hopeful to them? Yeah, absolutely. So, and this is so common what comes up in the work that I do because the majority of the women I work with are in their 50s, 60s, some in their 70s. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're on that cusp where they're like, my life right now doesn't look how it looked a few years ago or even a decade ago. And where I was needed, I no longer needed it anymore. And where is my purpose? Like, who am I? It's this identity crisis that is such an opportunity, but at the time, it doesn't feel like it. It feels like, it, you know, you feel the suck of it, right? Which is right. like, it sucks you into sadness, grief, depression. And part, and what I will say to that first is like, it's important not to skip over that, you yeah. know, because I think a lot of our culture teaches us to be like, oh, just put on a happy face, be strong or positive, think your way through right. that. And I, and that can be so toxic because it can um, really uh, cause us to just, you know, suffocate on our own I emotions and not feel heard and seen and, and really repress those emotions. So it's really important, I believe, to acknowledge them and experience them. But the big thing is to not let them swallow you up and not send them too long. That's right. You know, and to really you know, and it's not about like putting a positive spin on it or fake it till you make it or positive think your way through it. But I think there's a really powerful reframe that can happen once we have expressed it and immersed it and, and felt the suck, you know, like that's that would be right. like this, this and give yourself permission to be human, right? Where, you know, you can be, it's not logical. It's not rational where you, you have those moments where you're like, why is this happening to me? Right? Like this isn't fair. It's not okay. Like in giving yourself permission to not be okay, but then to not sit in that. And that's where I think the reframe is powerful, where we cannot control what happens to us, but we can, re re the one thing we can influence is who we show as in the face of it. And that's this right. is where it becomes a call, right? Like it's a call, it's a call to action of like, who do we want to become? And that's where we clear the slate and that's where we get to rebuild our identity, right? And sometimes it's from the ground up because some people never have their identity rooted in something bigger than them, right? Yeah. And sometimes it's just like a recreation 
and a re-reminder. You know, maybe we get that amnesia of like, who am I? And they need to come back. Or maybe they need to like give themselves permission to be a freshman and not know anything and have that clean slate, even if they did think they knew they were. So, you know, the biggest thing I talk about when I, um, there's this concept I teach with my clients called their inner compass. And in order to do that, what I invite to do is give themselves permission to not be a mother, a sister, a wife, any of those roles, and just come back to who they are as the dog God or a a soul, a spirit, a a woman, right? Just for for themselves first and foremost, which for so many people that are going through this big loss, whether they lost, um, you know, a family member or they're, they're grieving you know, being a, a, um, an empty nester, like because grief can show up in so many different ways, right? Yeah. Um. And so, but it's the hardest thing is to like they think they're being selfish, right? But like, I can't not be that for everybody That's else. Right. But the truth is, is that when you rush to go be a certain way of being for everyone else, you miss out on showing up as that for yourself. And then what happens? You have that cognitive dissonance of like, wait, this is who I know I am, but I'm witnessing myself not show up as her. Shame. And, and embarrassment and, you know, disappointment live in that gap, right? Versus yeah. if you carve out who you want to be as a, as the heart of you, the soul, the S, the spirit, the daughter of the most high King, and you carve that first, you can't not go be her as a daughter, a wife, a sister, a mother, a boss, a caretaker, whatever it is, right? So that would be the thing I would say is like, this is an opportunity for a reframe. Give yourself permission to feel the suck, right? There is yeah. no roadmap for grief. There isn't, right? And nobody should, if anybody's telling you how you air quotes should be grieving, they're probably not the person you want to be around right. right now, right? That's there's right. no there's no roadmap, right? But that being said, when you are ready, and I feel like there is that little like, you know, tickle in our throat or ring in our ear, we're just like, okay, I'm ready to hit the reset button or I'm ready to at least get ready to get ready to get ready, yeah. right? The first thing I invite people to do is come back to their identity and recreate it, like pretend like they don't know anything about themselves, start with an empty cup and start at the essence, the soul of they are independent of the roles that they play so that they can then go decide who they want to be in face of this terrible circumstance. Wow. That's powerful advice, Leah, and that's exactly right. And I think I think the idea of, of finding the essence and then playing roles within that essence is the is the mind shift that we need to have. I mean, because it's the the role you can lose. That's what I that's what I came to as a you know, my my job is neurosurgeon, but for most of my career I thought that was my calling. I thought my calling was surgeon in the operating room. And then what I figured out when I started writing books was my calling is to help people figure out what's hurting them and what to do about it. And I don't have to be in the operating room to do that, right? So I can, I don't have to worry about someday when I need to retire from being a surgeon, am I not going to be me anymore? Because I'm still going to help people figure out what's hurting them and, and how to help them. And yeah. so that that I, that shift between sort of what Absolutely. I do and who I am is, I think, the, the most important part of what you just said. Love it. When did you, when did you come to so the idea? It's so easy to get caught up in it. Sorry. What's that? I was just saying it's so easy to get caught up in those roles, too, and that's why creating that awareness is so massive. Yeah. Absolutely. When, along the journey somewhere, you made a step that's hard for a lot of people to make, and that is that you took something that you did, had gone through, and you decided to try to teach other people about it. Like, what? Talk about that shift in your, in your journey from being the person who's experienced this to the person who can teach it and why that's important and how you did it. Yeah, no, that's a great question. You know, one of the things is that um, what I discovered was that what I was searching for wasn't necessarily there. And I, I'm somebody coming from the camp of like, I mean, I, I was in therapy since I was a little girl. I did Overeaters Anonymous. I mean, I yeah. did every diet and fitness program. I read all the books, did all the programs, got the t-shirt, you know, all the things. Um, and it wasn't any one thing. And I think I, just like a lot of people, are looking for that one thing that's going to make the massive difference that's going to change everything. Um, and what I discovered is it wasn't any one thing. It was this three, di- because my problem was three dimensional, right? It wasn't just physical. It wasn't just mental and psychological. It wasn't just emotional and social. It was all of it, right? Yeah. And yeah. so, um, you know, I, what I discovered was that um, I needed to, and, and that was a distinction too. I needed to first and foremost, you know, metaphorically put on my own oxygen mask first. So when I talk to you about that summer of surrender, that's when I, I had been doing a lot of this self-imaging and, um, you know, I, I guess I called it mindset at the time before I was really into the brain set side of it. 
Um, I had been doing that for a long time, but the food and body stuff, when I discovered, you know, after my quarter life crisis on the paddleboard was that I couldn't talk about the food and body stuff with women until I figured that out. So that summer is when I really like when I burnt my first like big fat experiment where I took everything that I had learned about behavior science and psychology and all of that. But then, um, specifically I was obsessed with the anterior cingulate cortex because that would help me understand kind of like my addiction brain and also my physiological pain brain because I was having a lot of physiological pain, but I, I was no longer injured. So I had no more injury. My spine surgery had been like five years before that, but I still had a lot of physiological pain. So I was like, that's interesting. And so all that to say, I started obsessing over, over the social brain and realized a lot of my emotional pain was just manifesting physiologically. Um, and that's what led me to really look at like, well, wait a minute, what if this is what's going on with my sugar addiction? What if it's just, uh, and I say sugar addiction in air quotes, because now I realize like I wasn't actually addicted to sugar. Right. I just practiced a recipe of thoughts and beliefs and behaviors that were causing me to feel addicted and compulsive, like have this compulsive relationship to sugar. And when I practice a new recipe of different thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors, I still use sugar non-addictively, right? Yeah. But that being said, um, all of these things started coming together for me personally. And so I was doing um, the self-imaging work with my one-on-one clients after I retired from the fitness <coughs> industry, because at the time I was like, I'm never talking about food and fitness again. I was very mad at the fitness industry. I was yeah. like, this is a very toxic industry. They're harming people. I've come back full circle around now and just realized that I, hi, I'm the problem and me. I was the one <laughs> creating the toxicity, you know, but it's all good. I didn't know what I didn't know, but that did cause a lot of shame for a while. I've reconciled all that. But that being said, I was doing a lot of this imaging identity work with women, and I kept seeing that they were hitting the food and body struggle as well. Meanwhile, I had been free. I was I had set myself free on the food and body side of things, but I was like, I'm just going to be air quote selfish, keep this for myself because I downloaded a belief that I never wanted to talk about food and body stuff again because I was done. I was retired, right? Right. So then my women kept hitting these walls. So finally, I was like, okay, I just, I created kind of like a new language or a new system of things thinking around food. I'm just going to put together a little PowerPoint for you um, and just see how it feels. And that's how it started. I was just like teaching to my one-on-one clients and they were like, Leanne, this is crazy. Why isn't anybody teaching this? And that's what morphed into me taking what was then the self-image solution, which is still part of my stressless eating curriculum and turned it into a stressless eating curriculum. So part of it was I need to get over my own beliefs that I was harming people, like the do no harm thing. I had to make sure I wasn't harming people by talking right. about food and body again, because I was on TV for years as like Leanne Ellington, the fitness expert, teaching less, move more, harder, faster, more. And I felt I still was reconciling shame about that. But then it like smacked me you know, clear in the face that the systems of thinking that I had kind of piecemeal together. And I was a mutt. I was a mutt of psychology and neurology and biomechanics and all things, nutrition, all the things. Um, and I was like, it, it became a conversation of like, who am I to not teach this anymore? So I had to reconcile my belief, but I also needed evidence that this stuff was, was re- like, it was revolutionizing their mindset and brain set. Um, yeah. and that side of it was 11 years ago now, and it's just only gotten more robust, but I needed, um, I needed God, <laughs> you know, I, even though I didn't yeah. call him God at the time. Um, but I also needed that like empirical evidence to know like this stuff works and I need people to go through it and to give myself permission to be that mutt of different modalities and not just teach any one thing. It was everything. I love that. And you call yourself a scientist and I think you said it exactly the right way. Like, like friend, you don't have to be a PhD biochemist or molecular biologist to be a scientist. I mean, the, the yeah. art of science is being willing to ask questions and make a hypothesis and test it and be being, having enough character to change your hypothesis or your belief system based on the evidence that you discover. And and so you built yourself yeah. up a worldview and a, and a lifestyle out of following the scientific method. And then I think God called you in to say, hey, let me show you where this stuff really comes from. And you've done a remarkable thing that, that's yeah. helping people. How do people, who's the ideal person listening to you today that would say, hey, I need to call her. I need to send her an email and, and start uh, talking to Leanne professionally, maybe who out there listening would benefit from working with you more closely? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, first and foremost, if you have done all the diets and you've tried all things and, you know, things work until they stop working and you might have this inkling in your brain, there is something bigger and deeper that has nothing to do with food and nothing to do with exercise. 
I would invite you into the possibility that you are absolutely, absolutely, absolutely right. Um, but also maybe you have, or you've done all the things, but your view of yourself doesn't transform, right? You still feel unworthy, unbeautiful, unlovable, all those things that I would say is definitely a brain and self image struggle as well. Um, but also if you feel like handcuffed or you feel like you are a slave to dieting, a slave to exercising, and the way of sustaining this is absolutely unsustainable. And you know, in the back of your mind, you can't sustain it. And there's got to be a better way. Um, you know, I, I believe that there's there's something deeper going on and that you can teach your brain to do the heavy lifting. Um, but also if, if the version of who you are does not reflect who you want to be, um, and it's manifesting in a, a physical body that doesn't reflect who you really are, again, I believe there's a deeper problem at play. So, you know, if you're done with with, you know, the dieting and the weight loss run around and you're done trying to, you know, positive think your way through it or paint fake positivity on a poor self image. Um, I, I believe that there's a, an opportunity for a bigger, better, um, more healing, like long-term handle it forever kind of conversation. And that's the kind of women I love to talk to. Wow. We'll put your, we'll put your website in the show notes. If anybody out there is feeling this tug to check your website out, get to know you a little bit more, maybe even contact you for coaching. I think there's a lot of work that you're doing that would be helpful to the kind of people that listen to this show. And let's talk about your podcast for a minute. Leanne has two incredible podcasts, the what's God got to do with it show, which I love and then outweigh. So talk about those for just a second. If people want to check you out and listen to you, what are those two shows about? Absolutely. Um, Outweigh is actually the continuation of my stressless eating podcast where um, Amy Brown from the Amy Brown Show had Outweigh, which is really geared towards women that struggle with disordered eating. Um, anybody who's not familiar with disordered eating, if you're anything like me and you maybe fell through the cracks where you're not diagnosed with an eating disorder, but you feel like the binge, the binge restrict cycle, but also just feeling like you have... Um, you feel out of control of food, like maybe it controls you more than you control it. There might be a, a disorder or a dis-ease in your brain that is very fixable. You're not broken. You are not, um, you know, destined to stay this way forever. It is it's a thing um, and you're so not alone. But that's what way is all about over on iHeart. And then um, what's God got to do with it started as, as a one episode on the Stressless Eating Podcast, yep. um, where uh, it was kind of my coming out where I shared with my friends, my family, like, hey, I found God and this is what has opened up for me. And my heart was so gracious to uh, give me the microphone, my own solo podcast over there. So Outway um, is a continuation of stressless eating um, and what's God got to do with it is, you know, still where faith meets science meets that food and body conversation, but really what God has to do with everything um, and anything. So they are both over on iHeart or wherever you get your podcasts. And then um, yeah, anybody who wants to find out about the, the rewiring their brain and see how I operate on that front um there you can you can find my free webinar that it's all over the podcast and it's i've tried to make it as widely available as possible wow and it's helpful it's it's very useful i've been listening and i think it's it's interesting to me leanne like maddie jackson saw a sort of i think a, a parallel a gram with our work and how we kind of co sort of coincided with some of the things that we were both talking about and leanne and i had uh, maybe an hour long zoom conversation a month or so ago when we first discussed the idea of being on each other's podcast and, and it dawned on both of us or it really became obvious that we have a lot of the ways that we see things are fairly lined up and, and it's amazing to me that you just talked about disordered thinking in your eating because just this morning i wrote the first what's going to be the first chapter of my new book self brain surgery and i talked about how it dawned on me that a lot of the problems i see in my neurosurgery practice really come down to disordered thinking and, and when you parse that out a second ago we're not saying when we say disorder we're not saying a psychiatric disorder. I'm not saying that you right. you think your wife is a hat like the Oliver Sacks' patient. I'm saying that there's something out of order in the way that you think. If you come to me with back trouble and you think that that surgery is going to be the end all be all to your whole life and everything in your pro in your life is going to be fixed magically with my knife, that's not going to happen. Like you got to change the way you think about it, right? right. And so I think that right. one of the issues and what I wrote this morning was. People have, they think wrong about their thinking, they feel wrong about their feelings, and they believe wrong about their beliefs sometimes. And we all do that. And so I think what you just yeah. said is exactly right. Like we have, we have to take a look at our belief systems, the way we're operating, the operating instructions that we view the world through, and we have to reorder them. And I think for you, you found that through faith. And I love your story. And I'm so grateful that you spent some time with us today. What's one word of encouragement you could give somebody today on Good Friday, Leanne? 
Yeah. Um, you know, my word of encouragement, it's multiple words. It's just, you know, give yourself permission to not know anything. And wow. give yourself permission to say, I don't know what I don't know, and be an open slate and be an open book. And that leads to that childlike wonder and that childlike faith, because when we think we know, it it kind of cuts off possibility. Um, and so that would just be my my words, multiple, would just be, you know, give yourself permission not to know anything. Wow. Beautiful advice. Leanne Ellington is going to be back on the show soon. We're going to have another one of these deep conversations, and she's going to host an episode of the Spiritual Brain Surgery Podcast. So coming soon to that side of the show, we're going to have Leanne's testimony and where this whole what's God got to do with it thing came from. It's a powerful story that will help you change your mind and change your life. Leanne, thank you so much for your time, my friend. God bless you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been amazing. Appreciate you. Wow, that was a good talk. That was really good. Good Thank stuff. You. You're so, you have such great questions. It just it was an easy flow. You know, like yeah. I don't know. You've had conversations where it's not an easy flow. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, come on, get that over. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. No, this was good. This felt.